Good morning, everyone. My name is Mark Siomo. I'm the chairman of Ways and Means and the District 9 uh, Alston Brighton District City Councilor. Today is Monday, April 24th. I want to first start by saying happy birthday to my son, who turns 25 today. <laughs> um, and uh, we are here for our opening round of discussions around the FY17 budget. Dockets 0536 through 0543, 0536 through 0538, orders for the fiscal year 18 operating budget, including annual appropriations for departmental operations, annual appropriation for the school department, and appropriation for other post employment benefits. Dockets 0539 and 0543. Capital budget appropriations, including loan orders and lease and purchase agreements. Uh, I'd like to um, introduce my colleagues in order of their arrival. We have uh, Michelle Wu, our council president, as well as uh, Hyde Park, Rosendale, Mattapan, uh, District City Councilor, District 5 City Councilor, Tim McCarthy, and my friend. Uh, from East Boston, Councillor Sal Amatina, as well as Councillor Frank Baker from District 3. Uh, I'd like to remind folks that this, is, uh, this hearing is being recorded and broadcast both on Comcast Channel 8 and RCN Channel 82. We ask that everyone silence their electronic devices. Uh, there, if anyone would like to uh, testify publicly. We have a sign-in sheet to my left by the door. We ask that you um, state your name, any affiliation, and residence. We also encourage written testimony via email or email at uh, ccc.wm at boston.gov. And at this point, I'd like to turn it over to our CFO and budget director, Dave Sweeney and Katie Hammer. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the council. My name is David Sweeney. I'm the Chief of Administration and Finance for the city, and I'm joined by our budget director, Katie Hammer, uh, to present the mayor's FY18 recommended operating budget and FY18 through FY22 capital plan. Uh, we're extremely proud to be here presenting a thoughtful spending plan that increases operating investment in high priority, high priority areas such as schools, public safety and transportation, and for other purposes that improve quality of life in the city. Uh, as I've said before, this budget reflects reality. City revenue growth is healthy, growing by over 5%, but state aid prospects remain dim. Uh, we should have a we could have a better idea later today uh, of whether any state assistance may be on its way with the House budget debate kicking off. Uh, but we are currently projecting a net state aid decline of over four and a half percent for fiscal year 18. Additionally, our federal funding picture has not been as uncertain as it is today in a generation. Overall, projected revenue growth is budgeted at 4.8%. And this budget proposes to spend all $144 million of that growth. Uh, it's important to emphasize that before any other new spending was added, $81 million of this $144 million in growth was consumed by fixed cost growth and reserves for collective bargaining. The city continues to manage its fixed cost liabilities responsibly, but this requires ever increasing annual commitments to its pension schedule due to past employee costs, as well as paying annual debt service on bonds sold to build our schools, create our parks, and maintain our roads, amongst other things. Additionally, we are being assessed a growing portion of our budgets for students attending charter schools every year. A full $47 million is reserved for expected collective bargaining costs in FY18 as the administration works toward agreements that are fair for both employees and taxpayers. On the capital side, the city's multitude of multi-year engagement and planning efforts are coming together in the FY18 through FY22 capital plan. Uh, 
to maximize support for investments proposed by over 14,000 Bostonians through the Imagine Boston process, we'll increase our borrowing levels to the maximum amount projected to be possible under the city's debt affordability policy, increasing annual borrowing to up to $200 million over the next several years. Notably, this will allow for a billion dollar investment in school facilities over the next decade. With such lofty aspirations coming out of the city's planning efforts, supplemental financing sources will also be essential if the city is to enact its plans in any meaningful way. The mayor's proposal spends down the balance in the parking meter fund that's been built up through years of strong budgetary performance by the city to make transportation and public works improvements citywide. Projects include revitalizing all lane markings and crosswalks in the city and more focus improvements in areas such as on Dudley Street and Roxbury. The city also hopes to use over $100 million from the sale of a closed downtown garage, for which a surprisingly large price has been attained, to make transformational investments in needy city assets in traditionally underserved neighborhoods such as Franklin Park. The administration continues to support policies that add revenue, as this is the only way many investments desired by Boston residents will be possible. Creative savings and revenue efforts in Boston's uniquely strong development climate offset rising fixed cost pressure and state aid stagnation to allow for the sustainable investment plan we present here today. So with that, I have a PowerPoint that Katie and I are going to walk through uh, on both the operating and capital investments to kick off this hearing process. So, thank you. Uh, the FY18 recommended budget uh, is $3.14 billion in balances sustainability, increased investment, and fiscal responsibility. Again, uh, the fo investment focus is in the areas of education and public safety, although some new investments are made across the board. And we're able to build off of past budgets by expanding smart savings initiatives to avoid $60 million in costs, which is really the only reason we're able to make any investment proposals at all in FY18. Um, we continue the city's commitment to addressing our long-term liabilities and build on the administration's record of strong fiscal management. Uh, we continue to have the council and the administration's strong fiscal management validated by uh, external observers such as the rating agencies, uh, Moody's and S&P. Uh, the slide in front of you uh, shows a sampling of comments made by rating agencies during our meeting last month with them. Uh, they view Boston's management environment as very strong. The city's tax base has seen unprecedented gains in the past few years. We're in the midst of the biggest expansion in history with new development contributing to very strong new growth and unemployment in Boston remains very favorable. Uh, as has been the story for the last several years, however, they caution that net state assessments have continued to decline and this has placed pressure on growth of local source revenues to just to maintain budgetary balance. We continue to face budgetary pressures related to increases in pension and healthcare costs and increasing charter school tuition assessments. State aid continues to be a challenge to the city's financial operations given the increase in state assessments for charter school tuition. Uh, instability at the state and federal levels require increased stability and strong fiscal management at the city level. Uh, and we believe our, our um, responsible approach is as important now as it has ever been uh, with uncertainty at the federal level and uh, very stagnant growth at the state level. Uh, as, as we've heard discussed for the last month or so, there are federal proposals to eliminate uh, very important funding sources to the city, particularly uh, CDBG funds and other neighborhood development related funds. I think there's also some uncertainty about uh, the status of federal Title I through Three and IDEA funding in the long term, uh, as well as uh, the possibility of continued divestment from public housing uh, continuing through the new administration. Uh, and as we will probably discuss 20 times today, we continue to be concerned at the state level about the underfunding of uh, the city's charter school tuition reimbursement uh, line, uh, which has been proposed to be level funded yet again at about $81 million when I, I believe the statewide liability is approaching double that at this point. Um, 
while cities can't afford to replace the level of funding cuts anticipated by some at the federal level, we continue to engage in disciplined financial practice to best position Boston uh, to manage through these uncertainties uh, at the state and federal level. And I believe we discussed this at the breakfast, but about over a half a billion dollars in federal funds flow through the city and its related departments. The FY18 recommended budget of $3.14 billion uh, relies, in terms of overall revenue, on the property tax for a full 69% of revenues. Uh, that's now almost about $2.2 billion of, of the over $3 billion in revenue comes from a single source. Um, FY18, uh, we are projecting to be the second largest year of overall property tax growth in the city's history behind only the current year, FY17. Uh, we're also projecting $441 million in state aid, which now comprises 14% of overall city revenues. Uh, this continues to be over $50 million less than we received in 2008, a decade ago, in state aid. And this has been uh, fortunately uh, made up for by some uh, changes in law that have allowed us to levy uh, additional excise taxes and also through strong uh, new growth revenue on the property tax. We're budgeting excise, excises at $189 million and licenses and permits at $66 million as well. Uh, change in the net property tax, as you can see here, uh, very fortunate to have had high growth years the last few years, and uh, particularly the year we're in now. And uh, at almost $111 million, this will be the highest we will begin a year budgeting for a property tax increase in the city's history, in terms of property tax revenue, that is, uh, at about $111 million total. Um, more than half of that not coming from the Prop 2.5 allowable increase. So over, over three quarters of the revenue growth in the FY18 budget is from the property tax alone. Um, FY18 reflects a new base that incorporates FY17 record growth, as well as planning for another high growth year in FY18. Um, it, it again assumes we maximize the amount we can level under a levy under Prop 2.5 as well. Uh, notably, the property tax levy, uh, regardless of growth in assessed value, is constrained by Prop 2.5. This chart illustrates that to some degree. So a, a prime example would be a year like FY16, when total percentage growth in assessed value was nearly 16% but growth from the property tax due to uh, our limited ability to levy a 2.5% increase on existing properties and add new construction was limited to 4.7% in that year. So in some ways, the city doesn't fully realize uh, the, uh, th the benefit of the appreciation of its property values due to the constraints of Prop 2.5. And, and for instance, in the last... Uh, during the Walsh administration, we've seen property value overall citywide increase from about $100 billion in assessed value to $144 billion in assessed value, um, a 44% increase, but we've seen only about a 25% increase in the amount of property tax that we've we, uh, increased revenue uh, from this sort of explosion in assessed value, uh, which is a combination of appreciation of existing properties and new growth added to the base. Uh, just notably, I, I find this interesting, if, if revenue had just grown at the same pace as uh, the appreciation in value, we would have about $300 million more per year in, in property tax revenue. Uh, in terms of where our revenue comes from now, recurring revenue, uh, compared to where it came from over uh, several other points in time, we are now reliant for recurring revenue a full 70% on the property tax. So we're moving uh, what was once half of our revenue has surpassed two thirds and is moving toward three quarters of our revenue in terms of reliance on property tax. And this has pretty much been a one-for-one -one replacement of, of state aid during this period over the last two recessions. We used to receive 
We used to uh, rely on state aid for about a third of overall recurring revenue, and we now rely on state aid for about 14%. Uh, obviously, this structure is an anomaly compared to our national peers when we look and see what other cities are doing. Uh, by and large, they're not dependent on a single source of revenue for over two thirds of their total revenue. Many of them have uh, sales tax levies, property tax like us. Uh, also, some have income taxes, business taxes, commuter taxes, all sorts of diverse revenue tools um, that obviously have an impact on public policy and impact on the flexibility of, of their councils and mayors uh, to make investment decisions. Uh, Net state aid is decreasing. Uh, as, as I talked about, gross state aid has still not recovered uh, from the last recession, but the net state aid situation is actually uh, further compounds our state aid picture problem, primarily due to the addition of um, the ever increasing charter assessment, which we project to increase by another $17.5 million in FY18. Uh, the average net state aid decline since 2008 has been about $19 million. So in a sense, uh, this year is on the, um, the better side of that as we're projecting just an $8 million net state aid decline in FY18. Uh, this $189 million is a combination of a $52 million revenue decline and a $137 million increase in state in state assessments, 120 million of which is from charter schools alone. Uh, I, I think the most acute area of concern with regard to our, our state aid picture is our state education aid. Uh, you could see on this chart here, uh, Boston's education spending uh, from 2014 to 2018 is projected to increase by about $206 million on an annual basis, uh, 18 minus 14. Uh, yet over this period, our Chapter 70 appropriation has increased by $8 million and our charter reimbursement has declined by $9 million. So while we've increased our overall investment in education uh, by over $200 million, state aid has been flat. So this has been done alone by the city without the assistance of the state by and large. Uh, and in fact, we're looking at possibly matching our 2010 Chapter 70 appropriation for the first time since then in 2018. One of the main drivers of this obviously is our increasing charter assessment and the, uh, the flat nature of the reimbursement that we've seen. Through 2014, the state had typically fully reimbursed according to a statutory formula that uh, reimbursed districts for a percentage of transition costs uh, over a period of time. Beginning in 2015, this began to be underfunded, and it has been funded pretty stably since, but the overall amount owed to the city has increased year over year to the point that we're now being um, shortchanged $25 million projected in FY18 relative to what the statutory reimbursement formula proposes. Um, so this is the fourth consecutive year that we're projecting a major shortfall uh, in charter reimbursement. In light of this, the city has, has in addition to absorbing a lot of uh, the additional costs in our education system alone without the assistance of state aid. Uh, we have attempted to uh, put forth some proposals at the state level that would uh, change our state, particularly education finance picture uh, over time. Some would provide short-term relief, others would provide long-term relief. Uh, the mayor has filed comprehensive education reform legislation uh, that, that is multifaceted. It would increase annual funding to Boston by $35 million in its first year of implementation and position Boston to receive up to $150 million in additional annual aid in the long term uh, if the state identifies uh, a new uh, revenue source for education. This is sometimes talked about in terms of the RISE Act of of last legislation session or the proposed millionaire's tax at the state level. Our goal is to make sure that if in fact something like that occurs, Boston isn't on the outside looking in um, because 
believe it or not, many of the education aid proposals at the state house, while they would uh, be extremely expensive for the state and uh, be funded through tax, many Boston taxpayers would pay it. They would not benefit Boston necessarily unless the formula is tweaked exactly uh, correctly to benefit Boston. So uh, what this potentially could do if these uh, proposals were enacted is provide every Boston four-year-old with a high-quality pre-K seat, fix the broken charter school transition funding formula, increase our circuit breaker reimbursements, and again, uh, make transformational education fund funding available for Boston if the state does, in fact, identify a new education revenue source. Additionally, uh, we are continuing our approach of fiscal responsibility that has been validated by the rating agencies in recent years. Uh, we continue to pursue cost containment efforts, uh, make data-based managerial decisions, maximize revenue, uh, and emphasize long-term planning more so than ever before. Uh, and the, this budget builds on that record. We're uh, continuing practices implemented in the current fiscal year, such as reducing overtime hours where possible, eliminating vacant positions, uh, and working with departments to identify other cost savings measures. Uh, as I said at the outset, this is the only way we are able to make any new investments year after year is by finding ways to operate more efficiently uh, in our existing operations. Uh, we're also launching revenue initi initiatives this year to better maximize local revenue receipt, and we're continuing to budget in a conservative manner, uh, particularly given the out outstanding uh, unknowns at the federal and state levels and with ongoing collective bargaining negotiations. In terms of spending, uh, the piece of the pie on the right, education, uh, consumes about 40% of the city's overall spending between Boston Public Schools and char its charter assessment. About 19% of our spending is on public safety, almost $600 million. Uh, other fixed costs consume about $550 million. Health insurance on the city side alone is nearly $200 million. Uh, we spend about $150 million on our streets cabinet, public works and transportation. Uh, almost 80 million on public health, uh, and uh, about 200 and uh, about 40 other city departments split the remaining 250 million dollars or so. Um, obviously, that education piece of the pie translates into about a billion 250 million dollars. In terms of how how this uh, has changed from previous years. Of the $144 million in projected growth, about $54 million is projected to go to city services, $58 million to education, and $32 million to pensions, debt service, and fixed costs. Um, overall, in, including health insurance and, and uh, other appropriations, there's about 4% appropriation growth, but about 8% fixed cost growth. Uh, that really crowds out the opportunity for additional investment. But yet again, uh, the largest area of investment and the largest area of increased investment is in education. Uh, another way of looking at this, this same, uh, same issue of growth by category is to see that 50, right off the top of the $144 million in projected growth, uh, about $50 million is uh, fixed cost growth. Uh, when charter assessment is included, and another $31 million in growth is reserved for additional collective bargaining. So the, the portion that's available for spending, um, which would need to still include uh, health insurance cost growth and step increases for employees, is really limited to these white parts of the bar uh, in this chart. Thanks, Dave. Uh, we're really proud of our investment in the Boston Public Schools. This budget includes a projected increase of $40 million. Uh, the total appropriation is projected to be $1,081 billion after the collective bargaining agreements are negotiated. This budget includes a $14 million investment to extend the school day for 15,000 more students. BPS is also maintaining their weighted student funding formula in this budget. 
Over the past year, BPS completed a long-term financial plan, which has begun to pay off with efficiencies in this budget. Spending on our schools is projected to rise by almost 4%, even before collective bargaining reserves are used. That's a $25 million increase. This budget also reflects the, the feedback that BPS heard through their school committee process. BPS provides lower performing schools a wide range of differentiated supports, which total $16 million. This budget also includes, uh, as part of that, includes a $1.25 million reserve focused on supporting level three, four, and five schools that are losing enrollment. This table uh, shows a breakdown of that budget uh, that was approved by the school committee. Uh, direct funding to schools is rising by almost 4%. Uh, that is make, that's where most of our critical investments are being made, uh, which include funding for ELT, the extended learning time, for, school, for students um, who are experiencing homelessness, for vo vocational education, and for 100 new projected K-1 students. We project the increase to go up further after collective bargaining agreements are negotiated. School services budgeted centrally are increasing by 2.5%, and central will be declining by 5.5%. This reflects some of the savings initiatives BPS is targeting in the central office, such as reductions in stipends, food and travel, and tightening controls and reserves. In total, BPS's uh, appropriation will rise $29 million before collective bargaining. In addition, we've set aside a 20% collective bargaining reserve for BPS, which is an $11 million increase over FY17. This adds up to a $40 million increase over FY17. As Dave mentioned, our charter school assessment costs uh, is a fixed cost that we have almost no control over. It has grown on average 14% since FY11. In FY18, uh, the charter school assessment is increasing by $17.5 million. That's because 876 more uh, Boston students are expected to attend charter schools in FY18 than in FY17. This brings Boston's total charter school population to about 10,600 students. We're also paying a growing tuition rate of about 16,300 per student. This budget maintains high levels of support for education, as I just discussed, and keeping our city safe. Uh, in this budget, we're seeing public safety costs rise by 20.5 million for a few key reasons. The city had received a multi-year uh, SAFER grant from the federal government, which had supported the cost of 75 firefighters over the past several years. With that grant ending, we're now seeing those firefighters come back onto the operating budget. We're also seeing contractual increases uh, for some settled union agreements in the police department budget. De these departments, though, will continue the overtime reforms that we launched last year, which will, is projected to avoid $13 million in FY18. Uh, we are also making targeted investments in this budget. We are having we have a class of 20 new cadets, which will provide a stable pipeline of diverse candidates for the Boston for future Boston police officer classes. The police and fire department have recruit classes scheduled as well. The fire department will receive 13 new apparatus as part of the enhanced fire apparatus replacement program that we launched last year. And we're also launching an industrial cleaning pilot program to scrub four to five firehouses to reduce cancer risks for firefighters. The other 42 departments are growing on average 1.5 percent. 23 of these departments will see a reduction in their appropriation in FY18. Uh, in a year like this, where most of the departments and all of these departments do not have collective bargaining in their lines, um, this makes sense because we have a, a centralized collective bargaining reserve of $27 million uh, funded outside of here. Um, we're proud of the work that we're continuing to do to avoid costs in this budget. And we're now up to $60 million of costs avoided thanks to the uh, reforms that have been launched during the Walsh administration. Uh, in this budget, we're eliminating an additional 23 million, 23 million, we're eliminating an additional 23 long-term vacant positions in FY18. Uh, with including those that we eliminated last year, that will see 5.3 million in savings uh, thanks to inactivating long-term vacant positions. As I mentioned, the police and fire department, along with the transportation, public works, and parks departments, are 
uh, continuing their overtime reforms, and that will achieve $13.2 million in cost avoidance. Thanks to the health care cost containment uh, reforms that we achieved in the, FY, in the 2015 PEC agreement, um, we will achieve $10 million worth of savings in FY18, $2.6 million are, which are related to FY18-specific changes. Um, we are really proud uh, because we performed 18,551 streetlight LED retrofits, and thanks to that, we're now seeing $5.8 million of savings in, that, in this budget. BPS uh, has proposed central office and transportation savings, which we're seeing in this budget. And we're also seeing savings at EMS, thanks to some of the investments we made in EMTs last year, because they're reducing their overtime and increasing their third-party billing. Uh, we are continuing to see our health insurance costs grow. Uh, we had health care cost containment reforms that were achieved from the 2015 PESC agreement, which are supposed to have, uh, which we project will save $45 million in savings over five years. But uh, despite that, that work, we're still seeing uh, the cost increases from the broader Massachusetts market, which are projected to increase uh, our health care benefits budgets by 5% in FY18. Our pension schedule goes up every year according to a fixed schedule. Our fixed costs are rising much faster than our appropriations in this budget. Our fixed costs are going up by an average of 8%, where our appropriations are going up by 4%. And here, our, our pension costs are, are growing by $19 million in this year due to our pension schedule. Uh, two weeks ago, we launched the Imagine Boston uh, capital plan. Um, this has been based on the mayor's leadership in which we have done planning processes for the city, for the city schools, streets, arts, climate, and resilience. Um, the city has been engaging with the public about these plans, and over 14,000 voices contributed to the Imagine Boston 2030. This $2 billion, $80 million Imagine Boston capital plan is guided by these plans and invests in our infrastructure in every single neighborhood. We're investing a billion dollars in Build BPS over 10 years. Thanks to state, federal, and city funding, we're able to invest $709 million in our transportation uh, systems for this capital plan. That's our Go Boston 2030 plan. We also plan to carry out the Imagine Boston 2030 open space goals, including investing in Boston Common, Franklin Park, and the Emerald Necklace. We're completing major park and library renovations in every neighborhood throughout the city. And we're enabling affordable housing developments through our strategic infrastructure investments. We're also launching Percent for the Arts, uh, one, which is 1% uh, for our investments in uh, public art at $1.7 million uh, this year. We're investing in every neighborhood. Some examples are Smith Playground in Alston, Central Square in East Boston, Jamaica Pond Pathways in JP, Carly Community Center in South Boston, Dudley Branch Library in Roxbury, and I could go on and on. Uh, this pie chart shows a breakdown of the Imagine Boston uh, capital plan it, within the Imagine Boston 2030 categories. It shows this is all sources of the capital plan um, for all capital projects in this plan. So when you include all sources, our capital plan invests heavily in our school buildings and our transportation infrastructure. That's our roads, our bridges, our sidewalks, and our public realm. Over half of our transportation investment, uh, which is completed by our transportation and public works departments, is based on our ability to leverage external funds. In this capital plan, Mayor Walsh has begun ramping up our investment in our Boston public schools as part of our billion dollar commitment to build BPS over 10 years. When we look solely at our borrowing, you can see that our largest investment is in our, our uh, schools. Um, because we are increasing our investment in our Boston public schools, we are leveraging other sources to help pay for the needs of our transportation infrastructure and our open space. And here you can see, um, because of the needs that have been uh, outlined in these plans, we are increasing the use of all of our sources uh, to make sure we can meet those needs. To achieve this billion-dollar investment and build BPS, we are increasing our borrowing within our debt affordability policy. You can see in this graph that we are, uh, our projected debt service will come up to our 7% policy limit uh, under our plans. We are all, uh, this means that we're increasing our borrowings by 22.5% over the last, uh, last year's plan and this plan. 
we're also doing a better job at leveraging MSBA resources. And we're drawing on one-time funding sources, including our parking meter fund surplus balance to fund many of our road and bridge investments that are critical to go Boston 2030. Um, we are extremely proud of the investments we're making in this budget. Extended learning time is a cornerstone of this budget. This year, we're investing $14 million to allow 15,000 additional students to attend in 39 schools to receive 120 more hours of learning time. That's the equivalent of 20 added school days a year. We're also making other research investments in excellence for all, uh, and we're adding, we're adding 1.2 million in targeted investments that will benefit 3,000 homeless uh, students experiencing homelessness. We will also be uh, seeing more than 100 pre-kindergarten students more at BPS this year. And we're launching the Build BPS 21st Century Fund in FY18 to provide schools with 21st century tools as part of the capital plan. We're investing $709 million in implementing Go Boston 2030. This will improve safety for pedestrians, bicyclists, and other vulnerable street users. It will also unlock hundreds of millions of dollars of outside investments to transform key corridors. And it's maintaining our bridges, roads, and uh, sidewalks, and street lighting. With the funds in our capital plan and our operating budget, we're going to make major investment to revitalize all of our crosswalks, lane markings, and bike lanes. This will improve safety and access as part of Go Boston 2030 implementation. And we're extremely excited to add six Hokies so that we have a full-time Hokie in each of the Boston's 10 public works districts. This continues our focus on basic city services. As part of Boston's Way Home and Boston Home for the Brave Initiative, Boston has housed 842 homeless veterans since July 2014 and put an end to chronic veteran homelessness. This budget uh, improves on that by increasing our funding by 150,000 in general funds to su provide supportive services to veterans that are not eligible for VA programs. Our budget includes $25 million in both city and external resources to continue the city's efforts to end chronic veteran homelessness and provide supporting housing services to those who are form formerly homeless individuals. We launched the Office of Housing Stability last year, and in this budget, we're providing them with $75,000 to offer training for both landlords and tenants, develop tenant orientation guide, and uh, funding for families in need of emergency placement. In addition, our capital plan includes infrastructure investment that unlocks outside funding for affordable housing investments. An example includes the Whittier Street development and the roads in that. Uh, we have investments that I mentioned previously in our police class, uh, in our police cadet class of 20, which will create a stable pipeline for diverse young people uh, for future police classes. When we launched our cadet class in 2016, um, we have been successful in, re in recruiting diverse class, including 74% cadets of color and 36% female cadets. We have a new digital equity grant program, which will explore ways to address digital equity gaps in the city of Boston. Our data analytics team, which was created in 2015, has already proven its success. Uh, as we look to the future, the data analytics team will build on success, such as looking for more efficient ways uh, to process 311 requests. We're really proud of the investments that we're making in our parks and open space. This capital plan includes major park renovations to ensure our parks are among the most accessible and equitable. Examples include Harambe Park, Jamaica Pond Pathways, Franklin Park Pathways, Paul Revere Mall, Martins Park, Smith Playground, McConnell Playground, and Garvey Playground. And starting in FY18, we will invest in a small ro in rotation of small renovations to neighborhood ball fields to keep them safe and playable between major renovations. This year, we're launching the Percent for the Arts program, which is a commitment to public art in Boston. We will also consider, uh, continue the investments that we launched last year in arts and culture, including a residency program for artists, an artist resource, resource manager to help navig artists navigate the municipal services, and a small grant program to help, artists su help support our artists. We're also really excited to bring library services back to Chinatown. And we're revitalizing library branches throughout our neighborhoods, including Dudley, Fields Corner, Upham's Corner, Adams Street, Roslindale, and others. 
Mayor Walsh has dedicated increased resources to helping those in need of substance abuse and addiction support. Since the beginning of his administration, he has added, we've added 55 clinicians, outreach workers, homeless caseworkers and coordinators and other recovery staff at the Boston Health Commission. Last year, we launched 311 for Recovery Services, which connected a 311 to the PATHS program. Due to this investment, the PATHS has seen a 50% increase in calls and 74% increase in walk-ins, while the number of new patients uh, accessing services has doubled. Building on that success, in FY18, we will make an investment in allowing PATHS to stay open on evenings and weekends. We're also really pleased with a data-driven uh, investment that we're making this year. Data analytics team worked with EMS to review their data and find opportunities to reduce response time. Thanks to that, they are launching something called the Community Assistance Team with EMTs that will be deployed on rotating schedules in uh, particular areas of Boston that will make sure that we are able to uh, reduce response time. We're also piloting industrial level cleaning for firehouses to reduce cancer risk for firefighters. We believe this type of data-driven approach to investment and smart spending on reforms stands in contrast to the type of budgeting that's being proposed at the federal level. We are preserving and expanding on our offerings to our most vulnerable residents. We're investing deeply in education and public safety. And our investments in education will help close opportunity and achievement gaps. We're continuing some of the savings in, uh, that we have launched throughout the Walsh administration, including position elimination, overtime reduction, and health care cost containment. We're addressing our long-term obligations, our pension, our debt service, and our OPEB. And we're also uh, launching revenue initiatives to maximize local receipt revenue. All of these disciplined financial practices position us to manage through the federal instability. Finally, we launched a new website this year, budget.boston.gov, and I invite you all to take, uh, to take a look. The goal of the website is to unlock our budget books for the public. The website allows you to dig into our department budgets and provides context about the different changes. It provides an interactive map so that residents can look up capital projects in their neighborhoods. And it provides a series of featured analysis cards that provide deeper dive into areas of the budget, from ranging from our property tax to our extension of the school day. We hope you check it out as you go through the hearing process. And now we can take questions. Thank you. Um, let me recognize, uh, since your presentation began, we've been joined by District 6 City Councilor Matt O'Malley, District 4 City Councilor Andrea Campbell, and at-large City Councilor Anissa Sabi george And I will ask my colleagues to set the ground rules again that there's many of us that will be attending these hearings over the next couple of months and that um, in the first round, I'd ask you to stay within a five-minute question and answer period and then have another opportunity when we get back around. So with that, I will start. Um, so I, I, the first thing is the net property tax um, projection is, you know, a little bit lower than last year's. Can you explain your, you know, what the rationale is for that? Yeah, I, I think in a number of things. Well, one, I'll note, it's still the second highest year of growth in the, in the city's history. Um, it's higher than we actually recommended in the, in the mayor's recommended budget in FY17. In the tax rate budget, that number went up, which was fortuitous for the city as we now have more flexibility to do settle collective bargaining agreements, hopefully not use free cash to cover our OPEB obligation and 2017. Uh, also, uh, a number of uh, 121A agreements came off of the property tax rolls in FY17 and rolled onto the uh, property tax uh, rolls. Uh, we don't have as many occurring in 2018, so I think the apples to apples comparison is a little closer than it looks mm -hmm. to be at first glance. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I understand it's a projection, but it almost indicates like maybe we've reached that development max, maybe, and and things are kind of leveling off. I mean, and we've had discussions. I think everybody would agree um, that there will be a slow. It's not if there'll be a slowdown; it's when there'll be a slowdown. Um, a, B, I think that the most important thing we can do as stewards of the city budget 
is pass on. I started this hearing by wishing my son a happy 25th mm -hmm. first birthday uh, today. And as the next generation comes, the best thing we can do as stewards of this budget and this city is pass along sustainable budgets that fund our priorities, uh, adhere to our values, but at the end of the day, pass on a fiscally sound city to our young people. So I applaud the, the fact that, you know, out of the gate, all of the priorities of, you know, paying our bills, uh, making sure that the credit agencies look upon us favorably because that allows us to do more with less and especially the capital investments, the infrastructure um, around the city um, is so important. Um, how, can you give us an update? Uh, and, and I want to applaud you guys and the mayor on um, exploring uh, creative ways to get more revenue through the, the convention center um, um, money or uh, account, if you will. Can you explain kind of where Cliff Notes version of w what that attempt is and where it's at at this particular point in time. Sure. So we've we've filed legislation that would redirect two existing revenue sources: one, um, a vehicle rental um, or a, a re vehicle rental surcharge, and the other a sightseeing surcharge for duck boats and that type of thing uh, that are currently uh, being deposited into the state. Convention Center Fund. Uh, we propose to redirect that funding to the city specifically for early education with the goal of providing uh, universal free high quality pre-K to every four-year-old in the city. Um, though the Convention Center Fund is currently running uh, healthy surpluses every year to the point that the state actually swept the portion of the balance again last year and used about $60 million um, to balance its books at the end of the year. We think Boston has a strong claim on that revenue given that it is, you, it is exclusively produced in the city of Boston. These charges are not mm -hmm. uh, levied in any other community. Uh, and over 90% of the total revenues in the Convention Center Fund are produced in Boston as well. And we don't see a direct revenue benefit from that. Um, so it is still in it, very early in the legislative process. It's not clear to me uh, whether it will be a point of discussion through the FY18 state budget process, which is um, taking another step forward today with House budget debate. Um, but we will be actively advocating for its passage uh, mm -hmm. through the legislative process. We've been up there having meetings, advocating mm -hmm. to uh, elected officials there, but I think that's about as far as it's gone so, so far. Right. Um, I, I would like to offer my services. We write a lot of letters here, yep. you know, for many different things. And uh, I just want to offer my support for such a measure since we do generate that tax and is, is shown by your graphs. Uh, the increasing reliance on property tax keeps shifting more and more of the burden to, you know, homeowners and increasing values that you know, kind of um, prevent, you know, first time home buyers and moderate income first time home buyers from investing and in, in staying in our city. So uh, I'd like to offer that as well. Um, I'm going to pass my time on to uh, Councillor Michelle Wu. Oh, and just one other thing. Uh, the you know, the one time money is good and we know we can't rely on it. It's one time. But, um, you know, Winthrop Square, for example, uh, we need to realize that that's going to bring in $17 million per year in property tax. Is that correct? Uh, Close to? The projections I had seen, I think, were more in the $12 million range, but I think the point remains yeah, that there, there is a recurring real money. benefit to development as well. Yeah, great. Council President Wu. Thank you for all of your work and your team's work. Some great, great stuff in here, and we'll get into it in a lot of detail over the next few weeks. Um, similarly to Councilor Siomo, uh, would lo love an update on the state legislation, but with, rel um, with regards to the education piece that you talked about, what's the, what are the chances looking like on, on those proposals? 
I think with as with any state legislation, it's really difficult to to predict the likelihood of success. We we have made a very uh, concerted uh, engagement effort. I know Katie and I have been involved in probably dozens of meetings with various selected officials, both representing Boston and other communities. The education chairs, ways and means chairs, uh, speaker, Senate president, all of those folks. Um, they, uh, they're still early in their process with regard to holding hearings and passing legislation. The first major thing that they're doing this year is likely kicking off today with the house budget process, and then they'll probably re-examine what their agenda is. Uh, I think in a general sense, I've been, uh, somewhat pleased with the response though, um, that we, we've received. So we're going to continue to advocate. And I, I think to Councilor Siomo's point, uh, the extent to which we can receive any assistance in that effort is, would be greatly appreciated. Is it the time, and I just am not familiar enough, is it the type of proposal that other cities and towns would also benefit a lot from, or is it really more Boston? Okay. So there, some components are Boston specific and others, uh, almost every community would benefit okay. for. So some, for, for instance, one of our proposals would in, uh, provide six million dollars and increase circuit breaker revenue to Boston, but that uh, at different levels would apply to other communities as well. Uh, likewise, our, our charter school proposals, specifically, um, that would would over ten million dollars a year in benefit to Boston, depending on which aspects of it were adopted, would benefit mo any community sending uh, students to charter schools. Right. So it's a combination. Okay. Wonderful. Um what is the what has been the growth of revenue sort non property tax revenue sources been like um, compared to last year? So, I lo, um, it, uh, in terms of the broad categories, we're seeing about five point eight percent growth in total local receipts, but only about two point five percent growth in state aid in gross state aid. Um, which is really what pulls down the overall growth rate is our second largest sort of source of aid only growing by 2.5%. Okay. And when you said, so there was one slide, um, you talked about the $189 million loss of net state aid, um, mostly from assessments increasing, but also a revenue decline. So that's meaning state um, sales taxes, for example, so, so the, the the way we the way state finance manifests itself in our budget is they obviously receive a, a plethora of tax different revenue sources including business tax, income tax, sales tax, things like that. They then appropriate through the legislative process local aid, um, primarily for Boston. We rely on unrestricted general government aid, Chapter seventy, and charter reimbursement is increasingly becoming an issue for us. That overall amount declined precipitously during the recession and has never really recovered. Mm -hmm. It's now, grow we're projecting it to grow at just 2.5%. But then on the back end, our, our, largely our charter assessment is increasing at a much faster rate than the revenue increase is, um, that we're experiencing. So, for instance, charter charter assessment alone is projected to go up by seventeen and a half million dollars next year, and I think our overall aid, state aid increase is looking like something like eight at the moment. Oh. Okay, and if I have thirty seconds left for my last yeah. time joke, can you just briefly describe in a little more detail what the percent for arts program is? Absolutely. Um, so uh, this was a program that came out of the Boston Creates planning process. And uh, basically, we are dedicating 1% of our borrowing each year to uh, the public art. And so uh, we have been working really closely with, the, um, with Julie Burroughs, uh, our chief of um, culture, and as well as PFD and other departments that have major um, capital projects uh, to determine the best way to uh, begin implementing these art projects uh, throughout the city. We have some early examples. We, I believe, are working on a project in uh, the J.P. 
uh, library as an early demonstration project, but the first true percent for the arts will be in FY18, where we have set aside $1.7 million, which is 1% of our $170 million that we assume we're going to borrow uh, this year. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Council mm -hmm. McCarthy. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Chair. Welcome. We'll be seeing a lot of each other in the next couple of weeks. Um, really quickly, Michelle covered a couple of things that I had asked for, so the questions are getting thinner. Um, the eliminating positions, you have uh, $5 million in eliminated positions. Is that um, any department in particular? Is this because the technology is helping out where we're going? Because I just, I just want to know, you know, in the previous administration, uh, the CFO um, had a thought where uh, we would rather have a person working 100 hours a week than two people working 50 hours a week, which is an issue. Yes. So this is um, a reduction in long-term vacant positions, and that savings initiative uh, is really reflecting both the positions that we eliminated last year, that savings number, as well as the positions we're eliminating this year. So we're eliminating 23 p new uh, positions this year that have been filled, have not been filled in over a year. Uh, those come from about seven departments, um, including the library, the fire department, um, police. Uh, transportation, um, that sort of thing. So, Councilor, I, and I, I just want to clarify, uh, overall, the budget actually assumes an increase in the total number of FTEs by more than 250, but um, partially to fund those positions and other investments, we've eliminated positions that departments have chosen not to fill for long periods yeah. of time. Yeah. And it's so, clearly a different, you know, this administration has clearly a different focus of where they're putting boots on the ground. So, it's, it, you know, I think the basic city services team, um, from what I can see out in the street, um, looked a lot better than it did in, in, in the past, to be very honest with you. And I was on that team, so <laughs> criticizing myself. Um, the EMS overtime and revenue, um, we added 10 trucks, is that, is, and we added a couple classes. We had, yep. Yeah, so we, uh, there were, um, we made an investment last year in 10 replacement uh, vehicles, as well as a new class of 40 um, EMTs. And that allowed us to reduce EMT over time, but more, in, I think the larger amount of that savings comes from EMTs, EMS in, uh, seeing an increase in their outside reimbursement revenue. So that's their like health insurance claims. Okay. And uh, the BPS central staff, that's all bowling building, or is that the other building in Dorchester as well? Uh, I, don't, I don't know the physical break. <laughs> Yeah. Down, yeah. But, there. yeah. So I think um, one thing that is happening in this budget is that we are uh, moving um, the construction employees. This is not, um, this is kind of a net neutral move. Um, construction employees uh, from the uh, school department to PFD um, because we really want to, we think that PFD, will, that's really where our construction mm -hmm. should be managed. We want BPS to be able to really focus on education. So this is one of the reforms that was recommended through Build BPS. And so you do see um, in this, the way that it's reflected in the budget, though, is that it will be a chargeback in this year because it will be done midway through the year. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Councilor mm -hmm. Baker. Good morning. So, so. Yep. Yeah, so uh, the property management department, one of the reasons that we're seeing their budget uh, decline, uh, one reason is because we're changing the way that we charge back for um, positions that are funded, positions that are funded outside of uh, the department. So property management provides security services to um, the Water and Sewer Commission, and we're just, part of this has to do with the way that we're changing the way that we charge for those positions. Mm -hmm. um, in addition, there were some one-time investments that we made in FY17 that are eliminated in FY18 uh, in the property management budget, so that is showing some of that decline as well. Um, the largest, that largest percent increase is actually the environment department. That's largely because um, there, as a uh, decently small department, the addition of a few positions makes a very large, you know, percent change. And so um, this reflects 
um, both the movement of uh, position from one department to another, plus some targeted investments um, to in um, the Renew Bust and Trust program, as well as, uh, hold on one second, I'll remember the. So instead the of that, who, who's number two on the decrease and who's number two on the increase? Do you know? Um, so I know that, I don't know who this particular number two is here. I know that the Parks Department is going up by 4.7%, so okay. it's one of the higher percent increases. So that, that could be the It the could increase. be the Parks Department okay. there. And, and um, for street lighting, it has $6 million. Was that $6 million in, in like an energy bill that we, we used to pay, or is that $6 million that came to us? So that's basically when you look at the reduction in energy usage mm -hmm. due to that investment, that adds, and then you multiply that by the rate, uh, that adds up to about $6 million that we otherwise would be paying if not for this investment in these LEDs. It, is that a year-to-year -year change? Uh, no, that's like a cumulative. Like we save the six, so we'll, but Basically, yes. when you look at the. I mean, that is the annual That's the savings, annual savings, correct. But but, it, but it's a cumulative effect of multiple years. It took us a couple years, years of the infrastructure invest. improvements yep. to get to that six million. Correct. Yep. Okay. Um, hey, can can yeah. we yeah. talk? Can we talk a little bit about the uh, seven hundred nine million for the Gold Boston? Mm -hmm. Like, is that is that all our slow streets improvements and and that sort of stuff? It, it's a, a wide range of investments. Um, so a good portion of our transportation investments is thanks to our ability to leverage federal and state funding. Um, we sometimes design, we'll do designs of projects, and then we're able to get a lot more money uh, to fund those pro projects from the state and the federal government. So that's where a portion of that money is coming from. Uh, in terms of what we're able to do for it, yes, I think that in Go Boston 2030, a lot of the Vision Zero items yeah. were proposed, and we are funding Vision Zero, but we're also adding this uh, investment over the next three years to uh, improve our lane markings and, and revitalize those, bring those all up to a state of good repair, which we think is huge for, for public safety. And we're also invested in, in key corridors um, to um, improve safety there as well. Yeah, so, so is that where the slow streets are within that $709 million? I, I believe that, yeah, I think that's Vision Zero, yeah. Okay, yeah. And um, so, so Emerald, Emerald Necklace, we also have for um, the open space goals, the common Franklin Park and Emerald Necklace. So, so when we say Emerald Necklace, is there is there a possibility of of the original plan Emerald Necklace coming down Columbia Road? Is is that that that's the vision in Imagine Boston 2030, and the goal is to fund those investments with the proceeds of the Winthrop Square garage revenue. Okay, um, and along then with, uh, along with some investments in uh, public housing as well. Okay. From, from that revenue, yeah. And can you talk a little bit, thank you, thank no you, problem. Katie. Can you talk a little bit about these um, the EMS community assistance teams? Yep. Yeah, so um, when the data analytics team worked with EMS, they found that there were, uh, they looked at a, loca at a mapping of uh, different call types and the call types that were driving us kind of a slower response rate. And they found that there were certain call types that did not require a transport vehicle and that a lot of those were focused in the Boston Common and in the Recovery Road area. And so the goal of this is to provide... Which is mass, gas, and melnia. Exactly. And the goal of this is to provide uh, community assistance a team, assistance teams, team on the ground of EMTs <coughs> that can provide triage services. And if a uh, transport vehicle is needed, those can be provided. But if not, they can provide those services right there. And, and working with those <coughs> outreach teams that are coming exactly. out of coming out of um, you know, down there at Paths and exactly. So it's it's one component of that of that strategy. Yeah, okay, good, good. Mm -hmm. um, and in it, 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 there was another part of that. That so. But I, I one of will the things EMS. I so okay. another thing is now we're at EMS expanding. Where like what is the what is the plan with them? Will they have a space down there at at? at, at? So these are four. Um, these EM. This is basically four EMTs that will be. Um, so it's just they won't four, have a location. Four vehicles. Four vehicles. Four, 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 four individuals. Four individuals. Four individual EMTs that will be available in a non. They will be kind of on the ground in non-transport vehicles in those areas. So they won't have a location. They will be kind of roaming the city or whatever exactly. wherever the calls are. 
exactly. and will it be one person per vehicle or so is it teams I, or I, so I think they're still trying to figure out the best way to um, deploy to, them to, oh. right this is this is really um, com okay oh. I just got well, we can no, no no that's fine but I think we'll be uh, we can get EMS and really provide you better full answers yeah. on those questions thank you Th oh, thank you for your questions Next. sorry mr. chair it's okay we'll have another round uh, we've uh, since been joined by Councilor at Large Michael Flaherty. Chair recognizes Councilor Matt O'Malley. Thank you, Chairman Siomo, and good morning, lady and gentlemen. Uh, great to be with you both. Thank you for this comprehensive oversight of uh, what our next two and a half months are going to look like. Uh, can we go back to slide 21? And Katie, I actually asked you this question at the end of the, um, the mayor's presentation uh, where you've got the... Uh, we can maybe get it on the, oh, I guess it's oh, yeah. too hard to get to the screen, but it shows the 42 departments growing by 1.5%, a little more than half, you see increases, a little less than half, you see decreases. The last one, the most um, notable, is about probably 6 or 7%, yep. and I believe that is because one, it's a smaller department, one position was moved to another department. This, this one, this, the larger, the, this, yes, this is the management. property management that um, it has a few things happening um, that I, uh, one is that we are changing the way that we charge for some of their, that we charge back for some of their employees that are, are paid for by other departments, and we're also eliminating uh, one-time investments that were funded in the FY17 budget. Okay, so no positions will be lost. In, no, no, no not separate from the the not the the vacant positions exactly. that that are no, going no. to be Correct. no no positions are lost at all. Correct. There there uh, there are there is the. Elimination of those 23 vacant positions that are across those departments, um, but no, there's no... Uh, no layoffs, I guess, no is probably layoffs. a better way to no say it. No layoffs in the city. Other than central office. And, yeah, and I, I think in, in, BPS. in most of these cases where you're seeing <clears throat> these, de these declines in percentage budgets by between 1% and 5% or so, it's mostly tightening on, on things like salary savings assumptions and vacancies and things like that. I don't think there are any sort of uh, policy decisions to merge and eliminate okay. operations. Right? Excellent. And just on that end, so I think we save about $5 million by eliminating vacant positions. Mm -hmm. How exactly? Explain to me how that works. So over the, between last year and this year, we, so last year we eliminated over 100 vacant positions, and yeah. this year we're eliminating 23 vacant positions. When you combine those two together, um, we are, the value of those positions is over $5 million. But we're not, it's not as though we're paying we have so money allocated in the budget currently for it. We, we, we previously would have had to appropriate money for those positions regardless of whether it would have ultimately been spent, right? So if we ha hadn't taken this initiative to eliminate them, that money would have been tied up in positions that we never actually spent funds on. But by eliminating them, we're able to free that up and allocate the money somewhere else. And it would just sit in the account year after year? It would either contribute to overall budgetary surplus at the end of the year or cover, uh, be transferred to fund a deficit in another line or, or something like that. So let's say there used to be a very famous city position called the city censor. I think Dick Sinnott was probably the last <laughs> city censor we had. Obviously, we don't fund that anymore. But if that were still on the books, there would be money allocated for that position that would just sort of sit untouched in an account and then go to the surplus at the end of the year? It, it could have been. We, we also make certain assumptions about a number of positions not being filled for an amount of time based on historical information that okay. we call salary savings. But absent it, the position being considered for something like that, yes, we would, we would in some way fund the position uh, every year. Interesting. Um, so I think my favorite thing that you said today was talking about the funding of the Jamaica Pond Pathway Program. This is something I've been uh, advocating for since, uh, for seven years now, since I was first elected back in 2010. So I'm delighted to see the commitment from the city and this mayor. Uh, the second favorite thing I saw in this is on slide 22, and it talks about the, uh, million, the $60 million in avoided costs that you all put forth, and talks about saving $6 million for street light energy savings. So by switching to more energy efficient street lights, we are saving taxpayers six million dollars. Absolutely. Yes. That is remarkable. I have said this at every environmental uh, initiative that we've put forward that good green investment saves taxpayer money. Every fiscal conservative ought to be an environmentalist because here's another example of how we've saved six million dollars 
Are all the streetlights now the LED uh, and energy efficient? Uh, no, um, but we are. Th there will be investments later in the capital plan. So the six million is just a just a just the beginning. We can actually grow that number. We've done a lot of them. I, I don't know the percent that we've done. Oh, well, I can tell you how many we've done. We've done um, eighteen thousand five hundred and fifty-one streetlight uh, retrofits. I don't. I unfortunately don't have the total number on the top of my head, but there are there are likely more that we still okay. need to do. Okay, that's great. Um, now, another thing you talk about on slide 22 is the $10 million in BPS transportation savings. Yep. Yet when we go, and I know BPS is probably the bulk of my questions, as I would venture guess many of my colleagues when we sit with the superintendent and his team. But just since we have you two, if you go back to, it would be slide 18 that says BPS, although there's not a number on it, talks about the, the most significant increase seems to be 7.4% increase on transportation going from 108 to 116. So that looks like it's an $8 million increase, and we're touting a $10 million savings. So, yeah, so explain so, that to me. Uh, BPS has seen savings uh, over uh, two, they're, they're targeting that $10 million worth of savings over two years. Uh, five million of it was achieved in FY17, and they're projecting that second five million to be achieved next year. They have seen um, other costs rise as well, so while they are um, making the, uh, basically this number would be going up by more, if not for that additional $5 million that they're anticipating and in, in saving in FY18. Yeah, so it's, it's So actually, it would be a $13 million increase, but it's seven. Right, it's an avoided cost or calculation. 12, gotcha. Right. Okay, well that's a little, uh, we might want to tighten that up Clarify, a bit when yeah. BPS comes. All right, my time is up, but look forward to more questions. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Councilor Campbell. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Councillor Siomo, and um, thank you for your leadership. This is going to be a long process, so thank you, and thank you, Central Staff, um, and thank you, uh, Katie and Dave, for being here. I just, um, just piggybacking on um, Councillor O'Malley's question, I also had a question about this, the BPS transportation savings. Mm -hmm. um, so can you sort of walk me through that again? So I was a little confused. I thought that that $10 million savings was going to be realized um, in one year, not two years. Um, and again, of course, because transportation costs looks like they're going up, how is this a savings? So can you just talk through that a little bit uh, more? Absolutely. So I, I think um, they're right now on track to achieve that savings over that two-year period. Um, they achieved the first half in FY17, uh, and they have strategies in place to achieve the second half in FY18. They also had a number of unexpected external issues this year, which are putting pressure on the transportation spending. So those include the McKinney-Vento health care costs and vehicle insurance. Those are some of those increasing costs that they have uh, seen. So the $5 million in FY17 has been realized. Yep. And then the $5 million we're hoping to realize in F FY18. But based on what you just said, that's a, po that's a real possibility that's not necessarily the case. No, I, I think this budget, uh, so um, as... Mm -hmm. Basically, uh, the budget would be for transportation would be going up by more if not for this $5 million in savings. Those items that I uh, reference show why, talk about why, why it is going up in FY17, in FY18, despite these, the savings that they're anticipating realizing. And it's going up by how much? Transportation is going up by um, $8, million. $8 million. So if, the, if this $5 million isn't realized, it would be going up by more than that. Okay. Sure. The um, only reason I ask is because obviously given the stagnant state revenues, what's happening at the federal level, um, these cost savings that we've talked about in the past and going forward are, are that much more important. Um, and so, and being creative, you know, the convention center, all those things is, is, is really exciting. It'd be more exciting if we knew that it was moving faster at the state house, uh, but I'll leave that alone. Um, but I, I will say, the thing that I think about most when it comes to these cost uh, sort of avoidance measures is the sustainability of this over time. So I chair obviously public safety, so I have conversations with BPD captains and officers uh, quite a bit, particularly in my district, um, and how difficult it really is for them to realize these overtime costs. I mean, they're working incredibly hard to make sure that they realize that $13 million um, but how is that sustainable over time? Mm -hmm. um, can you speak to that uh, a little bit? Uh, absolutely. We think that the, and I think 
in working with the uh, commissioner of the police commissioner, um, the number of hours that we've targeted uh, for them to achieve, we think is is reasonable given their staffing levels, and um, it it just they are uh, they believe that it requires them, them to continue managing this really effectively, and so they have uh, made it a priority to make sure that they're managing that replacement overtime, um, and they have found and the trial you know the court overtime and that sort of thing, and they have found ways to to uh, bring that those uh, number of hours down. So I think what we're targeting, we think, is a realistic level of, of overtime savings. So if we were to do this again, um, it would, one, we would first see that this is a possibility mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that we could go to our public safety agencies in, in time of need and say, you know, let's have a real conversation about cost savings when it comes to overtime. Um, but I find it difficult to think that this could happen, for example, every single year. <coughs> So the number of hours that we're targeting for mm -hmm. them to hit in FY18 is the same as the FY17 target. Right. So that 13 million of cost avoided is based on those FY17 levels. So we think it's not that we're asking them to achieve an additional 13 million dollars worth of overtime. Payment. Right. It's the same number of hours, and I think uh, the commissioner believes that this is an achievable level uh, for the department. And so every year, any of these measures have to be evaluated to determine if it can be possible for that particular year. Yeah. Correct. Correct. Um, and then, of course, in addition, any other cost avoidance measures we could think of. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Just a, this is just uh, if we could quickly look at so for slide number five and slide number uh, fourteen, can you just quickly walk me through the numbers of those percentages? You did say some, and yeah. Sure. So if if you look at slide number five, mm -hmm. uh, the let's see the so the sixty nine percent property tax equates to about two point two billion dollars in right. property tax revenue. State aid four hundred forty one million. Mm -hmm. uh, excises is one hundred eighty nine million. Licenses and permits is sixty six. Uh, for on the spending side, are you ready for that? Oh, uh, what about others, reserves? Oh. Um, I don't know if I know the exact amount of other and reserves off offhand, but I can get you that. So okay. um, on the spending side, the education is $1.25 billion. Mm -hmm. um, public safety is over 600 million. I think it's 606 million. Um, the, let me pull out, I just have too many sheets here. No One problem, second. take your time. I, I think combined, uh, do you have a, oh, he's got it. Yeah, thank you. Um, Health insurance is two hundred million. Dave, I can't. <laughs> yeah. uh, other fixed costs are about five hundred fifty million. Mm -hmm. uh, streets cabinet one hundred fifty million. Uh, Public health commission seventy nine. Seventy nine. Okay. Uh, two hundred fifty million for other. Departments, which is about forty departments. Yes. Okay. Yep. Pension and other centrally budgeted funds. Uh, for the total of pension and other, so pension is two hundred eighteen million. Uh, that debt service is one hundred eighty six million, and other fixed costs are ninety five million. Other appropriations are sixty seven million. Wait, I'm sorry. Pension is 218 million. Other fixed costs is 550 million. No, no, no. Uh, yeah. I, so other fixed costs. When, when Dave was combining all of those things together when he told you fixed costs yeah. were that that 500, uh, 50 ish million. That combines uh, other fixed costs. That in, that combines uh, pension. Okay. Debt service, other fixed costs. Got it. 
and we can. Um, send I think we can give you this. Yep, yeah, no, that's fine. Too. Yep, um, that's totally fine. And one last question before I give my time up. So education, this forty percent is includes BPS and uh, charter school assessment. Can you break that apart for that? You know, one billion yeah. two hundred fifty million. It's uh, what one billion eighty one million to BPS and one hundred seventy five million charter assessment, I believe. One billion one. One billion eighty one million or Got so it. BPS and about one seventy five charter assessment, so thirty four and six percent. Awesome. Thank you both. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you, Councilor Sabi Jewett. I've got to be so quick because I'm sitting right next to him. Um, <laughs> Uh, for, first, I just want to uh, say that policy is often the driver of our cost of BPS transportation, and I think that our goal should be reducing the transportation cost, not just finding savings within the increases. I think we need to see a very clear reduction in how much we're spending um, year over year, so less than $108 million um, for fiscal year 18 or 106, whatever it is, it needs to be less. It shouldn't be a savings in the growth. I do want to first thank Councilor Siomo um, and the administration for um, starting this process today. And as chair of the Committee on Homelessness, Mental Health, and Recovery, I want to highlight some of the investments that I'm most excited about. We'll start on a positive note, look at the bright spots, and then we'll move on to some of my questions. Uh, specifically, I'm, I'm uh, thankful for the $1.2 million in school-based supports for our BPS students experiencing homelessness. This is a, cr a critical investment for sure, and I'm proud to be playing an active role as a partner with the Boston Public Schools and the administration in the uh, disbursement of these funds to our schools uh, directly. I'm also thrilled to see a continued investment in leading the way home, the mayor's plan to end chronic individual and veterans homelessness uh, through a housing first approach uh, that has made such an impact for so many individuals experiencing homelessness. And uh, we should all be proud of that work. And I do look forward to uh, continued investments, not just on the, the homeless end, but for uh, centralizing and streamlining, streamlining access to our affordable housing for both those that are experiencing homelessness and all of the residents of the city of Boston. As the city continues to grow, uh, making sure that those, those affordable units are ac easily accessible um, to the residents of the city is, is something that I'll be advocating throughout this budget process. I'm also excited to see the innovative steps that are being uh, that are taken to support our first responders who are on the front lines of managing the crisis on Melnia Cass Boulevard and Mass Ave. Um, and through the budget process, I'll also advocate for additional resources for the BEST program um, and their work with Boston Police Department, as well as additional funding for our Mobile Sharps team. As you know, we have two. Um, I'd love to see four uh, to pick up and dispose of the 20,000 uh, incorrectly disposed Sharps that we're finding across the city. And when I look at the budget as a whole, one thing that stands out to me is our need to really diversify our revenue streams. And we've talked a lot about that this morning. And I'm hoping to hear more from the administration about our plan to increase pilot contributions. It's disappointing to read in the budget summary that we expect those payments to remain the same. Um, we should be actively uh, looking for our nonprofit partners and institutions in the city to con contribute more, more of what they've committed to contributing. As vice chair of the Committee on Education, I'm concerned about, you know, obviously concerned about the Boston Public Schools budget and want to make sure that our resources are getting to the kids in our classrooms. I'm happy to see the reduction in sort of the centralized, the central office, but also want to have an understanding through the process. And I'm not necessarily here today, but with the superintendent to have a better understanding of that 3% increase that you reference in centrally funded services. So what does that mean? What does it look like? And you know, if it, if it means better direct services for our kids in our classroom, um, that's great. But I, I do want to have a better understanding of that. I also uh, still have some major concerns regarding the implication of extended learning time, uh, both as a cost issue for the district, but also as a practicality issue for our schools, especially those that are 930 start schools or extending their day to 410. That is affecting enrollment. Um, and I'm also uh, curious about how that's affecting um, the decline in enrollment at, at certain schools. Also, you know, pleased to support the mayor's legislation that would change the charter reimbursements. Um, but really hope that, and a number of my colleagues have mentioned it today, 
that you use us and help ask us to help you in an organized way advocate at the state, not just for the the um, changing or advocating to change the charter reimbursement, but really helping, letting us help you in a coordinated way, create more um, opportunity for increased um, state aid. And that brings me to my first question that, and I, I won't ask another one until the second round. Uh, we need to um, get more out of the state. I think we all recognize that. And if our state aid is 14% of our revenue, what, what um, from the state's perspective, how much are they giving us? What's a, what's a percentage of their budget that they're giving to the city of Boston? Um, percentage of their, well, the, their budget's about $40 billion, and we're getting about $400 million. So it's, it, and it's certainly much smaller than what we're contributing to them. Absolutely. Yeah, we, we project that taxes produced in Boston are approaching $5 billion a year. And, state tax. And I, I mean, I think that those numbers are startling, not surprising, but still startling, because and we know that our contributions far outweigh what we sort of get back in investment. And it leads me back to my work around homelessness, mental health, and recovery. In our shelters, 50% of individuals that are showing up at shelter, seeking shelter, are not from the city of mm -hmm. Boston. Um, so we need to really not just advocate at the state level for an increase um, to investment from the state to the city, increase that 14%, so it's more than 14% of our budget, but also, I see my clock here, um, but also working with our counterparts at the state to put pressure on our surrounding communities, cities and towns, to do, do some of the work that their residents are relying on the city of Boston to do for them. And I think that's really important for us to um, highlight and, and work towards. That's it for round one, did I do it? Awesome, <laughs> she's a role model. <laughs> Uh, Wait chair, till round two. <laughs> chair recognizes Councillor Flaherty. <laughs> <laughs> Came in for holding uh, the to this um, sort of the stepping off point, and it's good to see uh, Dave and Kate. Just a couple of quick questions. My focus will be, as it always has been, on sort of wasteful spending and just trying to identify areas. I'm not saying drain the swamp. <laughs> I'm just saying eliminate some wasteful spending. Um, and particularly, like we talked about the police and fire classes that are going on, and we've seen this sort of phenomenon over the last uh, several years whereby um, you have someone that gets through uh, the police academy, uh, gets on the job, and they may be on the job uh, six months, a year, or within a relatively short period of time, and then they jump to the fire department. And what I've been suggesting to both of our commissioners, and I probably would need some input from the budget office, is that if we would just start the academies at the same time, we wouldn't have the jumping. Um, you'd have to make a decision when you get the, when you, we call them the postcards. When you get the postcard in the mail that you've been accepted or you've been invited to participate, um, you know, for the recruit investigation for the academy, if you get them both at the same time, at that point in time, you have to make a decision. Do you want to be a police officer or do you want to be a firefighter? What happens is the police officer one comes in and they accept that one and they go through the academy and they get in great shape. They start the job. And in some instances, they're either still in their probationary period or they may just be on for two or three years. And then the other postcard comes. Um, my suggestion to eliminate some wasteful spending, and there is a significant amount of cost that goes into recruit investigation, the background checks, the neighborhood assessments, um, and the, the PAT, the physical aptitude test, which I think, and I've said all along, that should happen in the very beginning. Um, we do that at the very end, so we, went, we spend all this money on recruits, and then if they're not able to get over the wall or to pull the trigger or to drag the bag, uh, they're out, and there's really no recourse, nor do we recover any of the funds that we've spent. So I really would wish that... Um, um, the, the budget office would give some thought to, to sitting uh, with uh, both respective departments and try to have sort of more of a coordinated effort around when we're putting our classes on. I know we can walk and chew gum at the same time. There's no problem with having a police academy and a fire academy going at the same time. And I think by doing that, we're going to save millions of dollars um, and it will prevent folks from jumping. Um, so that's sort of my opine, I guess, for for the wasteful spending piece. And just want to touch on two that have been mentioned in this budget. We've seen them in the slideshows in the briefing, and that's the BCEC funds that uh, we have two home rule petitions, mm -hmm. uh, two, home, two home, home rule petitions that have come through the council. One is actually this evening, as a matter of fact, um, uh, later on this afternoon, I should say. But uh, so we, we're dependent on that. So we're depending on the, the success of those home rule petitions. I'm one that never, uh, particularly in this business and in this building, um, I guess uh, count your chickens before they hatch, but in the event, how, hypothetically, that 
that BCEC home rule petition fails on passage up at Beacon Hill or same thing with the Winthrop Square Garage. We have two instances of somewhere maybe between 14 and 16 million for the early education piece. And then we have the 153, which is going to go a long way on for, for our parks, for our housing, things like that. So are we forecasting um, if there's a hiccup, if you will? Um, so those are my questions. If you can address them, one, two, yeah. three, and hopefully I'll so meet the timeline. I, I think on, on your first question, we'd be happy to sit down and work with the fire and police commissioners to talk about ways to smooth that process so that there isn't any unnecessary waste with sort of administrative issues of people jumping departments with right. classes. Right. And you understand it's happening with probably maybe eight to 10 individuals are jumping, mostly going from police to fire. Yes. Um, and I just think that if we start both academies at the same time, or if those postcards come into that person's household at the same time, then and there, they have to make a decision. Do they want to be a police officer or do they want to be a firefighter? And what they do is they rope a dope. They take the police one because it's the first one that comes in the door because they don't know or expect that the fire one's going to come in the door. So they start down that road and there's a huge expense to that. And then their card comes in six months later or a year later. And then they say, oh, yeah, I definitely, this is what I want to do. And from a, from a cost savings, it makes sense. But also from the, the kid in the neighborhood that actually would, would give anything to become yeah. a police officer, he becomes a pawn in this whole veterans preference cycle, you know, that, um, you know, had that seat been open, we might have been able to get to him or her mm -hmm. before they made the decision. But because of that, so it's just, I just think if we can tighten up on the top um, and have them both happening at the same time, we'll, we'll eliminate wasteful spending, but also we'll be able to get people that really want the job mm -hmm. to the job. So thank you, Dave. I, so I, I think that there's, if there's a way to better coordinate that, that makes all the sense in the world. So we will talk Great. and thank see you. if there's something that can be done there. On, in terms of the question about reliance on sort of passage of le legislation for sort of in order to make financial investments going forward, I think we're just, we're, just, we're just going to have to monitor those situations as they come. Uh, in terms of the um, universal pre-K legislation, I don't think we anticipate that that investment would be made in fiscal year 18. So it's really something we'd be dealing with in fiscal 19 and beyond if, if that legislation were not to pass. We have been able to increase access to, to pre-K by, I think, about four, over 420 seats during the mayor's uh, term, but obviously that's a lot slower and increase than we would anticipate if we had $16 million more uh, okay. to spend on this purpose per year. On, on the Winthrop Square issue, uh, as we spoke to at the beginning, we are, our FY18 through FY22, Imagine Boston capital plan already anticipates maximizing the amount we borrow, uh, maximizing the amount we borrow uh, in compliance with the city's debt affordability policy. So it's difficult to see uh, a scenario in which the $153 million in investments could be made uh, without, without an additional supplemental revenue source in the near term. Um, so obviously it's just a proposal. We'll monitor to see it, if it passes the council and then uh, up at the state house. But um, that's something that would have to come at the expense of other proposals in the future if those were to be funded. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Council Baker, you have any follow-up? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, just quickly about, will you go back to the paths again? What is, what is that? So the paths? It, it's, no, I know what the path is, oh, yeah. but, but, but times, okay. is it 7 to 3 now, and, and what are yeah, we expanding? Yeah, so we're, we're expanding it into the evenings and weekends. I believe it'll be open until 7 p.m. in the evenings uh -huh. now, and on the weekends, I believe... Um, I, I think nine to five, but let me double check. Saturday and Sunday. Saturday and Sunday. Yeah. Good. And, and um and these these what I see in front of me is reflective of the when you say calls that's just calls related to that path call on three one on three one one here. Yeah. Yep. It's just uh, basically showing the success of that uh, three one one initiative. We're really trying to use uh, data to to see how well our investments are doing and mm -hmm. to when departments are proposing new investments to really uh, look at data. If the um, EMT investment is a perfect example of where we're, we're actually using data to make that, to yeah. prescribe how that investment's made. So I wonder if there was any way, like, uh, are any of these 311 calls coming from down the Cape or anything like that? <laughs> no. do think? Uh, I don't know the answer to that. We can yeah, investigate yeah. that. Yeah. Just because you wonder if we're investing in That's Boston and then it's your success question. now. There's 218 calls per or, or 
uh, success has gone up from 125 to 218 a week. So, so that's another 100 people down on the corner of Molina Cass. And I, I mean, just out of curiosity, good, what's, you know, what are those to calls? Know. What would the breakdown be? They're all not going to be people going into path. They may just have questions also. Mm -hmm. sure. But thank you. No problem. Thank you. I'm, I'm good, Mr. Thank you, Council Baker. Councilor Asabi Joy. Thank you. Um, so I just want to get into a little bit of the um, of your presentation from today. So slide 22, which is the cost costs avoided, mm -hmm. 13 million dollars for reducing the overtime. Have, have we hit that goal? I know that we've recognized it as a reasonable goal, but have we hit that or projected to hit it for the sure. year? Uh, so the um, departments have made significant process progress against the goals in FY17. We're still monitoring. We we watch these very closely. Um, I think we're extremely impressed with the work that's been done, but we're going to continue monitoring these until the end of the fiscal year. So will we hear the to-date number um, uh, during the, we, say, the Boston Police presentation? Yeah, we, we can, um, oh, we can work with them quarter. to get you an update on where they are. Yeah, just, yeah the third quarter, quarter number would be they, fine. They, I will say they did hit the biggest piece of it, which was the sort of mid-year FY16 10% reduction. Um, it was an additional 5% essentially for FY17. So the, the, the first phase was very successful, but we will have them give you an update during their hearing as well. That would be great. Um, and then on the streetlight energy savings, um, what, what's the role of rebates in this? Because I understand that we can also submit and that those rebates are playing a role maybe in funding. I don't think it's public works or public facilities. I think it's maybe the environment department. So we have, you know, let me get back to you on that. I, I want to I wanna make sure I have a crisp answer. Great, because I mean, those, the yeah. rebates. No, it's a, it's a good question. We certainly, um, I know the environment department takes, uh, works to get, works to get those rebates uh, figured out, but let me, let me make sure I get a good answer on that. Great, thank you. No, because I think it's a, it's a, a substantial number um, mm -hmm. if we can continue doing that. And then on, and I will ask this of the superintendent as well, but perhaps you know the answer to it, the extension of excellence for all um, through our schools, you know, I, I support the excellence for all, but I also support advanced work classrooms. Mm -hmm. And there has been a tremendous amount of conversation around the possible elimination of AWC classrooms. And um, I'm, I'm curious if you know whether as a district we're looking to eliminate AWC. Not that I'm aware of. Mm -hmm. uh, we will certainly have the superintendent be prepared to talk more about that, but that's not something I've heard. Great, and I, I will ask, thank you um, for that. And then um, on, you, you referenced the Whittier Street housing development with a $30 million HUD grant. I think that's fabulous. With sort of the changes in the federal government, are we looking to lose these down the road? What's the future projections when it comes to this federal funding? And the HUD stuff. So I think this was this particular one um, is committed to uh, this particular investment. Right. I think we are concerned about the uh, future funding for uh, the housing housing authority programs, and it's something that we're watching extremely closely uh, to see um, how that will be funded in the in the federal budget and how their programs will be going yeah. forward. I, and I would just add, I mean, with very difficult to answer questions, I think, about the future of federal funding. There's just so much uncertainty. We're monitoring it very closely. This particular area, I believe about $285 million of the city's 515 federal revenue is through public housing. So uh, changes to policy related to public housing could have an extremely large impact on the city. So it's... And uh, I think BHA would tell you that there had already been massive divestment from public housing during previous administrations, and they're, they're hopeful just to sort of stop the bleeding in a sense. Uh, so it's something we're monitoring very closely, but the unpredictability um, is sort of what drives our sort of responsible approach to budgeting in general, and in, in, uh, with, the, with the possibility that this type of large $30 million opportunity won't exist in the future. Are we doing any parallel sort of planning, budgeting on the, on the you know, we, we're continuing with, you know, certainly hopeful, hopeful attitude that this sort of funding will continue. But what's, you know, and I'm also concerned about some of the CD, CD, PG, PG grants. Yeah. Thank you. Say that 10 times fast. I can't. Um, and it's, 
you know, its impact on some of our small business, uh, small businesses and our main streets and, and all of that. Are we doing some parallel budgeting or so, planning? I mean, I would say we have a number of efforts going on. We've, we've done a lot more work than we've done in the past to catalog our overall uh, federal relationship in, in light of the new administration in Washington. We are involved in a number of advocacy efforts across public policy areas nationally with other, other cities and other advocacy groups. Um, I think we know where our exposures are, and we are, we are always looking to prepare ourselves for uh, a situation sort of like what we went through at the last recession where the city could be called upon to provide uh, more than it had in the past relative to overall revenue. So we don't have, you know, like a plan B or something like that because it's just the, the order of magnitude even isn't certain at this time, but we're certainly approaching this budget with the possibility that uh, change in approach at the federal level is possible going forward. I think, um, too, let us as the local electeds, you know, capitalize on some of our relationships, yeah. um, you know, to continue, you know, supporting that work and that advocacy. My last question is regarding, I, I think it's great that you've got the budget online and the capital projects online. One of the questions I have and sort of what I've learned from my first budget process now going into my second is, you know, articulating some of the timelines around the capital budgets because it's great when we say it's part of our capital plan, but the timeline can extend out. And that's fine. I think mm -hmm. that, you know, it's, it's part of how this work happens. But for the, you know, the, the layperson or the average constituent, they're like, wow, my playground or my library is part of the plan, and they think they're going to go to a ribbon cutting in this current fiscal year. So could you, I think that if we could list some of that online, um, even, it doesn't have to be down to the date of the groundbreaking, but a better explanation of what a capital yeah. item means or what it is, and then also even a general timeline on what constituents can expect. I think that's a great suggestion. We, one thing we do try to do is for each project, we try to say what stage it's in. So if it's in design or if it's um, in construction, we try to list that with each project. But I, I think your point is well taken that most people don't know how long our construction projects take, and they do take uh, several years. So we'll, we'll look in that. And I'm still trying to figure it out. Too. So <laughs> it'll be helpful to me when I'm responding to a constituents. Absolutely. So Absolutely. thank you for that. And um, no Chairman, problem. thank you. Thank you. Uh, before I just close out, I'd like to recognize our chief of the Boston Fire Department, who was honored by receiving the National Fire Chief Award uh, recently. So uh, kudos to Chief Joe Finn. Um, and, and just to piggyback off the, the uh, you know, uncertainty of federal funding, I think, uh, Chief Sweeney, you mentioned uh, about $500,000 of our operating budget comes in the form of grants and such, maybe from the federal government. Is that well, it's, close? It's a, it's a little difficult to speak about it in the context of our $3 billion budget, but we receive over $500 million a year, we project in federal funds. Mm -hmm. In the form of sig grants. Significant amount of money. Right. All entitlement programs, grants. Right. Right. All sorts of right. Um, and just to name one that I heard recently that got cut was Meals on Wheels. And if he's willing to cut Meals on Wheels, <laughs> uh, what's next? So I think we, we do need to be very cautious um, in our expectations going forward that we'll receive the entire 500000 and proceed carefully as we analyze this budget and see what things happen not only at the state level over the next several weeks, but at the federal level, which is, you know, talking about their budget as well going and talk, uh, I believe, in October 1st start. Uh, so with that, uh, I want to thank you for thank this you. Uh, comprehensive slideshow and uh, answering all our questions today. This thank hearing you. is adjourned.